Hello, and welcome to another episode of Brains Behind AI. Today, I have with me Mark Stevens. He is the president and CEO of Boone AI. It's a no-code machine learning integration platform for media-driven organizations, and we're going to learn all about it on this episode. Prior to Boone AI, Mark led the media and entertainment divisions at organizations, including Autodesk, Avid, and Microsoft. Mark, Excited to have you on the show and welcome. Harry, it's great to be here. I uh, appreciate you uh, having me on. Look forward to looking forward to the conversation. Great. Mark, before we dive into the, the company and Boone AI and what you are building, we want to learn just a bit about you and, and see how your personal journey led you to building Boone AI and, and where you are. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it's a bit of an indirect path. You know, maybe full disclosure, I was not one of the original founders of the company. Um, I came in probably several years after the company had been up and running. Um, you know, my, my personal history was I had 20 plus years. So, so talk about those parallel paths and then maybe how they they reconnected together at some point. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of the of Boone AI and, and the company, it started out founded um, as Zeroa. It was a you know a, a set of media technologists, a bunch of people that you know I, I would say came out of the the film uh, visual effects space, working on some of the largest, most complex media projects. You know the you know. Lord of the Ring films, Avengers movies, and um, you know, I, I think it, you know, you know, if you kind of roll the clock back to when the company was founded, there was a lot of innovation in the AI machine learning and computer vision space at that time. You know, so so I think that there's a bunch of ideas around how do we leverage all this AI ML technology to start to transform digital media management, right? So that that's that's where they started out in their journey started. My journey started, um, you know, I, I was I was in the media space, computer graphics, you know, kind of a, a tech, you know, te technology heavy, but then got more business focused um, as a tech executive in, um, you know, I would say media content creation tools, um, selling to a lot of those same customers. And, and a lot of what I focused on, I realized kind of when I stepped back over my career, a lot of what we did is try to democratize technology. And, and when I say that, you know, it's like, how do we get um, what are very complex, you know, tools and things that only, you know, only a, a you know, highly trained programmer can actually get on a screen and take that and get it into a set of tools in a form factor and a price point that, you know, we can grow the market and get it out to lots of people, right? Um, and I think that that's what, like, over my career, that's what I did a lot in the 3D animation and graphics space. You know, we, we kind of took that technology that was in the lab or built by the movie companies who did something very specific for one movie. And then they, you know, then we took it and found a way to generalize it and make it available to, you know, to an artist who may not even have a programming background to be able to make those same amazing pictures. And you kind of look at, you know, when I started, you know, there was a one or two shots in a visual effects movie, and now you have hundreds of shots and the whole thing is a, a vision. And, and part of that is just because you're able to democratize the technology. So, so let me wrap this back up and, and kind of talk about where the, the paths collided. Um, I, I think, um, so at the time it was Zero, well before it was Boot AI, um, they were, you know, what they were finding is, you know, so yes, there was interest in, in, in need and how you can kind of leverage all this computer vision, machine learning, gain insights into all your media. Um, you know, how do we monetize all that? But I think that what was happening is that they found that, you know, there was every customer engagement was almost like a custom development effort, you know, so it was almost like, a, you know, I don't want to say it was a consult. It wasn't meant to be a consulting service. I think the goal was to be a product. But what you found with every separate customer, they almost you were doing something different, and you were building. And maybe you had some tools that you could leverage that you were saying, but like it was not. It's not scalable. So, 
So I think, you know, we kind of connected, looked at that whole story. And, you know, what I, what I came in to look at doing is saying, hey, is there a way to start to look at how can we, how do we start to put this in a, you know, look at it in a little bit different way? Is there a way we can start to put things in, in a form factor, make it more accessible, make the price more accessible and get this out to more people? And that's, that's really what started, you know, when I came on board, that was kind of the genesis of Boone AI. And, you know, over the last, um, you know, I, I would say year, year and a half, that's what we've been doing. And we launched, uh, we launched that platform uh, several weeks ago now. So, um, yeah, so that's how we, that's how we got here. Yeah, congratulations on that. I saw the press release. So did they find you or did you find the, the founders, the original entrepreneurs who started it? You, you know, so it was, um, so, so actually, there's a there's a couple of things that happened. I actually, um, when I had, you know, after 20 plus years um, with similar technologies and teams, and you know, I in some ways the original I tech I started with 20 years earlier, it it transformed. It got bought and sold into different companies, but I, I sold it and I grew it, and you know that that kind of played out over the course of that time. Um, I decided it was. To, you know, time to go, you know, do some different things. I went out, um, I did some consulting for a bit. And I think through common contacts that, you know, we had in the media industry, I ended up doing some consulting for um, Zoroa at the time, you know, what was transformed into Boone AI. Um, and that's how, that's how the relationship started. They, they were, seed funded um, by Gradient Ventures um, as, you know, who are Google's, um, you know, I would say seed AI ML investor um, and, you know, met with them and talked about some of my ideas on how, you know, we could kind of look to how we transform, you know, the technology and the business from, um, you know, being, uh, you know, more custom development focused into something that we could have more broader market appeal and scale um, in terms of just getting the technology out to more people and, and having a scalable business around it. Got it. So um, so you joined the company and it seems like you have been hands-on. Uh, the, the team has been in terms of getting the product ready to the launch, which you just recently yep. had. So um, can you sort of... Um, Talk to us what what, what those uh, last couple of years has been in um, in terms of building out the product and what are some of the things and considerations that has gone into it? Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, so so I think um, you know on there's there's pros and cons to history. Um, you know, I, I think anyone who will you know has inherited um, you know some some parts of technology or customers of the past, you know, I think that you want to, so, so I think the good thing on, on the good side is that there was, um, there was a lot of knowledge in the team, you know, just in terms of going through some learnings one or two times about, um, you know, how, how they did this and how they'd like to do it differently and, and what was working and what wasn't. Um, but then you also have some of the legacy of, you know, you have existing customers that have, you know, installations and setups and, and you want to be careful, right? Like, you know, your reputation is important, you know, to say, hey, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing something else, you know, so, so I think mm -hmm. it's a, you know, it's a bit of a trade off. And, and, you know, you also have some of your revenue stream coming in from those customers, too. So, you know, you're a startup, you can't just say, hey, we don't need you anymore. We got this better idea, um, you know, depending upon how well funded you are. But, you know, we were we, so I, you know, I was in the situation where we were trying to, you know, manage and I don't even want to say soft land I mean we had a transition plan for those customers but that was going to take some time while we're while we're saying like okay you know we we don't we know we don't want this to be every customer is a special case right so how do we how do we step back and say what you know what does the market need what are some of the things we've learned that are in common across all the customers that we can start to generalize and you know make applicable because, you know, the, I think the, the team itself that came out of the industry, you know, saw a set of problems they were trying to resolve. Um, I think when you looked at some of the customers that we were supporting, um, they also had some commonality 
across them in terms of the problems they were trying to solve. So I think it was just popping it up a level and, you know, trying to look at it at a little bit higher level and, and see where those, um, you know, those pain points that were shared across a broader audience, you know, and, and I think, you know, the other thing that happens too is over time, technologies that you build on evolve, right? Like I think, you know, the cloud service providers, um, you know, the larger ones are making massive investments, um, you know, obviously in their infrastructure, which makes things easier for us to do, but also in their AI ML libraries, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more off the shelf to build on. So, you know, this isn't as much of a, hey, let's start from scratch every time, right? You know, how do we leverage the, the good stuff of that all these companies are doing and try to broker that and you know not that that's not going to be the you know I, I don't think even today we're very far from saying well if you take all the off the shelf stuff you have answers to everything not at all but I think you can avoid doing a lot of work um, yeah. you know if you if you do that yeah speaking of that right let's jump to the product boon AI um, yeah, yeah just, you have described it on your site. You call it the no-code machine learning integration platform for media-driven companies. Uh, yeah. what, what, what does that mean? And sure. uh, I know you started touching on what, what, the, what your vision and idea is there. So if you can just elaborate a bit um, in layman terms what your product is and what it does for the companies. Yeah, sure. So, so I think, you know, it, it solves a couple of different problems. You know, I, I think that if you look at, um, you know, so, so you know, a lot of people in my team, what they, what they told me is that, you know, they were in charge of, you know, these production technology teams, someone would come to them and say, hey, I want to use machine learning and, you know, an AI in our pipeline to do these things. Can you set that up for me? And, you know, you, you have a week and you got to do it with your existing team and no, I don't have any more money for you. Right. Right. So, so I think that, you know, they stepped back and said, wow, like that's, it's kind of crazy. Um, you know, because what, what we saw is that, you know, a lot of times the, the, you know, the risk is high, um, you know, in, when you're doing these machine learning projects, uh, risk is reasonably high. Um, results are not necessarily known at the start. Are you going to get the results that you want? And, you know, you needed, um, you know, there's a few pieces. There's the data science behind, you know, creating a model that actually works for you but then actually deploying that model and scaling it in production is another whole set of technologies, right? So, so I think we, what we tried to do is, um, you know, package up some of those infrastructure things by, you know, leveraging cloud technologies and starting to leverage, you know, and then for the data science model, starting to leverage the off the shelf tools from Microsoft and, and Amazon and Google, and, you know, then also, you know, add some tools to do customization, but at a higher level, you know, with a nice visual interface that kind of abstracts having to set up the whole infrastructure to even run one model um, on one image, which is, you know, time consuming in itself. But like you kind of now you give people the ability to run you know, hundreds of models, you know, once you look at what the cloud providers have, and then you look at, you know, the open source libraries and, and PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, you know, what we've tried to do is, is package those things up. So now within an hour, um, you know, you're basically just pointing to a, a bucket of images or videos, and then depending upon the problem you're trying to solve, and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, you know, the problem trying to solve and the models that you may need, you can kind of go in and select the models you want to run. And then there's a nice visual interface to be able to understand and experiment with the results, which is another, you know, a thing in the media space, which um, is important, right? Like when you, you know, people in the media space are used to looking at visuals and pictures and working, you know, that's their frame of reference. You know, it, it's not a spreadsheet of numbers and big JSON files with lots of, you know, lots of text in them, right? It's not their strong suit. So, 
So I think that what we tried to do is, um, you know, give people results that they could start to understand and experiment with different options um, off the shelf, you know, bringing custom models they created and then, you know, be able to do some AB testing. Um, and then eventually, you know, cause the other thing too, like, you know, machine learning and in some respects, it's still reasonably expensive to run at scale, you know, it's different, you know, can I, I want to experiment with, uh, you know, with a gigabyte of files versus I have, you know, several petabytes of data that I want to process and run through this information through, right? The cost profile is very different. So you'd like to be able to experiment and try things out. And then, you know, once you know what works for you and your use case, then, you know, you can kind of lock that in and the platform is, you know, built in a way that it is scalable um, and, and can handle, uh, you know, through our Kubernetes cloud infrastructure can, can scale up and, and handle those large payloads. Yeah, that makes sense. So can you give us an example of what is a use case, a common use case that machine learning is addressing for, for media companies? I understand you're that integration platform, but it yeah. would really help the audience if they can understand yeah. if you can break down a use case. Sure, sure. So I I, I can talk about um, a few different things in <clears throat> in in different uh, types of companies that we work with. Um, like you said, you know we we tend to um, be that bridge um, for the companies to be able to get all that enriched dynamic data. And then um, where do they, where do they use it, right? Like, I, I think that, um, you know, there's some companies like, so, so just automatically tagging information in, in, in an image, um, you know, so they know which images had um, a certain logo show up in them, right? Which images had a certain person um, that may have shown. So, so, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of the companies, the way that they, they have solved these problems in the past is that um, they have people go out, you know, someone says, hey, you know, find me all the, you know, find me all the shots with Robert Downey Jr. in a Lamborghini in New York City. Um, because someone wants to uh, do a marketing piece, right? Like, and they'd have someone run around and looking at all the B-roll. And, you know, so now if um, all your footage is tagged, you know, someone can sit in an interface and say, you know, Robert Downey Jr., Lamborghini, New York City, boom. You know, you get everything popped up to the, to the frame. And then it doesn't just say, hey, it's in this two-hour video, go find it. It's going to tell you exactly at the time code. So that, that's one example, um, like usage rights management. Like people want to know, you know, if they're like, do they, are they, um, you know, are the properties they're using, are they, you know, are they putting something up they're not licensed to show? You know, they could check things like that, right? Um, you have content moderation, right? I, I, you know, am I showing any sensitive content? Um, foul language, you know, violence, those types of things. So all these machine learning models that are getting, you know, better and better um, every day, um, you know, continue to grow. And um, so you can do more and more with these things. Um, I can go on and on like yeah. visual similarity search, right? Like, so a, so a um, you know, example, a, uh, a retail company, you know, wants to say, hey, I, you know, show me all the things that look like this shirt, right? Um, you know, that aren't exactly like it, but, you know, visual, you know, that are visually similar, right? So those are, those are some of the things that, um, you know, people can start to do. Yeah. Um, no, that makes sense. And if I can put it in a simple words, it's like, instead of having humans watch the video and manually tag uh, what what's happening in its scene or shot, you have a machine learning model that's, watching the video for you and tagging it and making it that's searchable right. right that's right that's yep. that's very valuable super valuable so yep. so now we understand what the product is um what are your typical customers what what does the target market looks like for you and given you just launched right we, we, which i would say yep. you have a beachhead you're starting out with Yep. Yep. So, so I think, you know, just based on, so, so we, we decided to um, start, so, so a lot of us just based on our histories have a lot of connections in the media space. So, 
you know, some of our targets are production companies um, who are doing, um, you know, who are doing full length features, who are doing commercials, who are doing, um, you know, different things like that. Um, so those are those are some of the companies. You know, we have people that are doing in the virtual goods space, right? So they're building catalogs um, for people of virtually of all their goods online, and they want to you know they want to tag all those things and you know make them searchable and accessible. So um, you know those are those are different type of customers we're working with sports teams. Um, you know, I, I think that they're, you know, a lot of these sports teams are, um, looking at how to monetize their assets in different ways and, um, you know, making, you know, they, they go back and they want to find footage with certain things in their archives because they're putting on a, you know, a 20 year special on a certain player or, you know, um, things like that, that they're doing. So, um, you know, so that's, um, those are some of the, some of the types of people that uh, we've been engaged with so far. Yeah. Now that was one of the use cases I thought about sports team and because I know how much attention goes into watching the videos of your game as an athlete to see how you did and how yeah. the, the other party's team is doing and how you compete with them in the next game. Um, so that's that's very very interesting, and there's so much tape. You'd go back even 20 years, right? There's a lot to uh, someone can learn from just uh, once they know what tags to search for and and quickly curate that those yeah. uh, snapshots. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, now, in terms of the software, are you um, is it sort of software as a service where you go online, you upload the video and everything gets tagged. How does, how does that work, right? If I'm a customer, I want to get on, what, what do I do? Yep. Yeah. So it's, it really is as, as simple as that. Um, you know, you sign up, you create an account and then we have, uh, we have a user interface that walks you through a process. Um, you know, it's kind of one, two, three, point us to um, the, the source content that you want to analyze. Um, okay, here's, you know, depending upon what you're interested in, here's your different choices of the different AI machine learning models we could run for you. And then, you know, a nice visual display, um, somewhat of like you see on an editorial timeline, if you're doing video of the results um, where you can, you know, start to search and filter and, um, you know, start to understand the results you're getting, start to do some A-B testing against different models from different vendors or, hey, you know, I'm not getting the results I want. Um, if I create one of my, on my own, am I getting better results than what comes off the shelf, things like that. So yeah, that's, um, you know, like we said, we've, you know, we've targeted under an hour, at least, you know, to get, um, you know, start to get results and start to experiment again, you know, a, a lot of the, the AI, you know, machine learning process is, um, you know, it is iterative, um, you know, you do learn things, you do have to refine and adjust, but, you know, I, I think what we want to do was remove all the, the heavy lifting of setting up the infrastructure to do that, mm. um, you know, and then let people focus on the results and what they need to do or the results to enhance their business um, and not all the nuts and bolts that go into um, getting it, getting it up and running in the first place. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm, I'll ask a technical question just for my own sure. uh, sake. So we're, when you say, when I point you to the, to the library or directory where I have all the videos, in our case, say the podcast videos we have, yeah. are you bringing those videos on your platform, on your cloud, or are you just bringing the, the tagging? How, how are you, where does the, the yep. content sits? Yeah, so, so what we try to do, you know, what, what we've tried to do in our service um, is we, we actually are taking, you know, what we'll do is we will upload, 
the file, um, we will create a proxy of it. Because if, if you look, most of the machine learning models, they don't work on full resolution um, content, right? Um, they just don't. So we, we create a small proxy. We throw away the original. We don't need to keep it. Um, and then we do the processing within our cloud. You know, we generate those results that stay uh, in, in, in our case, it's an Elasticsearch database. Um, and then, you know, we have, uh, you know, so basically the way the platform, you know, the, the platform is the, the APIs um, and the SDK because any interface that we've built that we make accessible to the end user was built off our SDKs. So basically, you know, at that point, if you want to integrate those results into um, a media asset management system, or if you have some of your own internal applications that you want to connect this to, um, you know, there's, there's a whole set of documentation and examples and source examples of, you know, ways and how to do that. So, and we're starting to build out more um, of a library of what I would say pre-built plugins to some of the more, um, you know, more widely used uh, content management systems. So really people just can, can plug in and go. Um, yeah. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even have to do any integration there. That's, that's awesome. What is your business model? Is it a monthly subscription? Is it based on the content? How do you yeah, so, charge? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so what we, um, what we tried to do again, you know, this, you know, our, our goal here was about trying to get the, the accessibility down and the price down. So we have, um, you know, we have a flat fee subscription to be able to use the platform um, that you can, you know, you can bring your content in and then the variable portion is the, um, the AI ML usage. So, you know, so there's a, you know, there's a per hour, what we tried to do is, um, you know, start to try to um, generalize a bit the cost. So because each vendor, each API, you know, slightly different costs, slightly different cost model. So again, it's another layer of complexity that people try to have to figure out. We want to, we want to try to simplify all that and say, Okay, you, you pay us, um, you know, to, to keep your, your data on the platform, to be able to search it and, and keep it accessible. You're paying us a monthly subscription fee to have access. And then, you know, you're, you're also paying a um, per hour cost for, you know, let's say it's video. Um, it's per hour cost per video per, you know, it's also per, you know, X number of images if it's images. Um, and then you, you know, you pay for the ML the machine learning that you run on those. So that's, you know, that's how we break it up. So that way, you know, if someone's not running a lot of AI, AI ML, they're going to have a lower cost of entry than if someone is running uh, a significant amount. Yeah, almost like a utility bill there. Um, that's, right. that's That's great. It, okay, so now switching to challenges, right? And what, you're, what you have built, it's not, not an easy product to build. There's so much that goes into it that I can think of. So uh, what, what are some of the challenges you encountered in terms of getting your product to market and, and how did you tackle them? Yeah, um, so that's, that is a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, one, one of the, biggest challenges that we have been, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things you try to figure out as a startup is where is your identity um, as a company. And, you know, I think in some ways your customers can pull you in different directions. Um, you know, are you going to be a tool for developers that um, is in their toolbox and that they use to help get their job done? Are you going to provide an end user solution that does everything for people? You know, they say, hey, I don't want to know anything about this. I just want to know it works. Um, are you going to fall somewhere in the middle and be that kind of connection between the two that gives people, you know, because I, I think where we 
we landed, you know, I think the company has gone back and forth a bit, you know, and, and from a pure technology point of view, you know, I, I can't say there was one problem we got stuck on, but I think from a um, product market fit point of view, I think that that's been one of the hardest challenges for us is, you know, finding out like what's our true identity. And, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're starting to land on it. And it's, it's been, you know, it's been, you go out there, you talk to customers, they start to, to, you know, experiment with your stuff, you get feedback. I think, you know, what I've learned is everyone likes to be polite and say your stuff's great. Um, you know, so that you got to filter through that and make sure you're asking the right questions and, and getting to, you know, um, what, would you need to be able to start to use this now, right? Like what makes it a must have for you versus something that is just, wow, that's really cool. I, I, I'd i like to use that someday, right? And I think that there's that, um, especially because because we're, a, we're a, a bit technology infrastructure, you know, there's that balance between, um, you know, the engineering team doesn't necessarily have the business problem to justify the budget all the time. So you got to kind of, you know, you got to kind of balance like being really clear about what problems you can help solve and how do you help solve them? Because, um, you know, someone somewhere has to say, if I'm going to use this tool, how am I making more money or how am I saving costs or, right? Someone's going to ask you those hard questions, right? And I think those are some of the things that we'd, um, we've had to work through over the past couple of years. Yeah, no, that's excellent. I'm going to double click on one of them, the, the startup identity challenge you brought up, right? And that the yeah. reason I bring up is because a lot of startups go through that where uh, they will, there, there's this fine balance between who you want to be and where you can make money in short term, right? You talked yep. about, hey, maybe tools is a quick way to make some money while we build out the platform. And sometimes they run into that, but then they get locked into uh, the, the, their, uh, everyone's point of view is their tool company, right? And not a platform. So it, moving from that identity to another becomes a little bit harder. Uh, just yep. like how movie stars get stereotyped into roles um, once mm -hmm. they play that role, right? And they yep. get good yep. at it. So yep. um, I want to I want to understand, or actually maybe what is your advice to the entrepreneurs that are building something and, and also at the same time in their early stages trying to figure out how they yep. define who they are? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I think there's a couple things that I would say, um, you know, I think focus is incredibly important. You know, I, I, I think it's always, you know, I, and this is a, um, it's hard to define because there's never one right answer, but I think that, you I know, mean, I would say focus is important. Having a vision that, you know, of where you want to get to is important at the end I think that the road you take there, you should have some flexibility on. You know, if you're, if you're too rigid on that, I, I think that, you know, just the amount of constraints you put on the problem may doom you to failure in, in some way, shape or form. You know, either because you don't have the money to get that far or, um, you know, the customers just aren't ready for, sometimes the customers aren't ready for it. You know, you say, this is a great idea. This is going to help everyone, you know, and nobody's doing it yet, but then the customers just aren't there yet, you know, in their business models and their technology adoption curves and things like that. So, so I think that, you know, in some ways, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, you, you may need to change the end goal as you, you know, as you go through this journey. Um, but I do think a lot of the times it's just that, you know, have some flexibility on, on how you get there. Cause if I look at, uh, you know, if I look at this company's experience, um, you know, some of the initial, I would say fundamentals about what they saw the company should be, it's not like they've drastically changed, you know, but I do think the road that we are taking to get there has, you know, 
has definitely took some twists and turns. And, and I'd say be, be open to that, um, you know, have that flexibility. You may need to make some trade-offs in the short term for the, you know, the greater good of the long-term success of the idea, the company, all those things. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent advice. You made a couple of points that resonate with me. One, you said, know your focus and stay focused on that have a vision, but be flexible in terms of the road and the path you take to get to that vision. Because the ideas evolve and the technology may evolve and even the thinking may evolve as you as you build the product out. So it definitely resonates right. with me. Okay, great. Um, now uh, I'm moving towards more towards the industry that can leverage your applications. And what, one of the things I've seen in industry in general, actually, regardless of the industry we talk to, there's always this hesitation from moving from the way we do things and to, to an AI-driven approach. And what, uh, what I've seen uh, a lot of startups run into is they see it as a, hey, cool, fancy tool. Uh, let's, we, can, we can play with it on a side, but... Um, but but they don't really it's it's really hard to get traction with with them mm -hmm. if i can yeah. um put it like that so mm -hmm. uh, in your experience um do you have any advice for for entrepreneurs that are bu building something and taking it to the industry how um how can they get traction and how can they get uh through some of the biases that exist um given mm -hmm that it's cutting edge and it's a bit of a buzzword and all that. Yep, yep. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point because I've, you know, I, even before I came to Boone AI, you know, in my previous life building um, content creation tools for 3D animation people, you know, anytime you talked about AI, it was like, you're going to do stuff and not even need an artist, right? Um, to to be able to do anything, and they're saying, "Hey, wait a minute, right? Like, you know, you, you'll you'll never be able to, you know, create a masterpiece without without the artist." And and I think, so the way I look at this is, I would actually say, you know, I think we use the word, you know, when we talk about AI and ML, we're going to automate things, and and I think the better term to use is augment. You know, because, you know, like, like, I think that, um, you know, so, so like in the creative space, instead of saying, hey, you know, all the A&I and ML is going to have all the, the uh, you know, is going to do everything for you. It's like, how do you have a creative assistant, right? Like, how do you have someone that may be able to give you more options or think about different ideas faster, think, things like that? You know, I, I think we have to approach it that, um, you know, it, I think there's a couple of things. One, um, there is a there is a statistic that we looked at um, when when talking about all this stuff, and there was a Forbes article about how 87% of uh, AI ML projects never make it into production. So I think some some people have been you know somewhat snake bitten by AI ML, you know all the promise, and they tried all this stuff, and they spent a lot of money. And they didn't get anything in the end. And now they're a little bit concerned to go back. I think you have the other dynamic about there's certain people that are, you know, may, maybe they think, oh, well, you know, automation, I'll lose my job. And, you know, what will I do if, you know, if this just is able to do everything for me, right? So, so I think we got to, you, know, you, you got to back off a little bit of that in your approach and, and think about like how, are they going to be able to spend time, you know, how, how are your tools and your technologies going to allow them to spend time on the real value add and differentiators of your business, right? Like I, like I say on, on, you know, with our product, you know, what, what we talk about sometimes is like all the infrastructure and plumbing to set up to run an AI and now model at scale and look at the results and stuff. That's not, you know, if you're a production company, or um, a retail company, like that's not your core competency. That's not driving your ROI. So if someone else has figured that out and they can automate that, you know, they can, you know, they can, they can take some of that off your plate, um, you know, or you start to provide tools and capabilities that just, you know, let the, uh, let the users um, 
do, you know, they, let them do more of what they do in the creative, you know, we're in the media space. So this is, this is like, we think a lot about the creative pieces of their work, let them focus on the creative stuff, the things that, uh, you know, the machines aren't going to be as well at, and how can we assist them in, in those things? Um, so that's, you know, th that's some of the ways that, um, I like to look at it. I think we got to, you know, part, part of, part of our goal too, and what we were doing is, Try to bring the cost down, the fear of experimenting down. So it's not, it's not a, you know, it's not a big investment in, in risk and cost and time and people and all these things. And you know, people can kind of on the side continue to experiment, see where it helps their business. Um, you know, some things will work out, some things won't, and um, you know, make it make it less an all or nothing um, type of proposition. Yeah, no, great, great advice. I like what you said. It's it's the augmentation uh, versus uh, saying, "Hey, it's the artificial intelligence that's going to replace you, or replace what you do," and um, also taking the barriers down for them and making it easier for them to experiment would definitely help get the traction. Great, great advice there. Last question for you is. Um, where do you see, what's the next milestone for Boone AI? What are you working towards next? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I think for us, you know, it go, goes back to what I said in, um, at the start, right? Like, I, I kind of looked at, you know, I, I look at it this way. If you, if you look at, you know, this is somewhat of a, I'm going to do an analogy, you know, there's, you know, when you're looking at like people working with on data problems and things, you know, like the number of, so, so for people where you need C++ programmers, um, you know, you, you know, the, there's only so many, you know, there's what five, like if, if you look at some of the data, you know, like 5 million C++ program competence in C++. If you look at scriptures with Python and everything, you get into the 10 million, to, you know, 10 million, um, number realm. And if you look at people who, you know, are able to use something like a spreadsheet, you're talking about a billion, right? Like it's a big number, right? So I don't think the next step for Boone AI is going to be to jump to a billion. But I think if, if we want uh, AI and ML to become more mainstream, the tools have to continue to get easier, you know, they're going to have to, to democratize, they're going to have to come down in price, they're going to have to be more accessible to people who don't necessarily have hardcore programming, scripting, data science backgrounds, if we want to kind of get these out to a broader market. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at, um, in terms of success for us in our next step, can we can we branch out beyond those, um, beyond those types of people who have a lot of expertise in AI, machine learning and programming and all those things that will really be success for us if we can get to those people. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That's a good goal. Hey, uh, Mark, thank you for uh, being with us. This was super informational. Really appreciate the time. Yeah, Ari, it was, it was great catching up with you. Um, enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to talking again soon.